Welcome, this is a recorded session of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Conference of the PKI Consortium. This conference would not have been possible without our sponsors in Trust, HID Global, and PQ Shield, and the organizational support of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Working Group of the PKI Consortium, in particular in Trust, Logius, TNO, and CWI. That kicked off in 2016 when we announced it. We went through three different rounds. Um, the third round started in 2020. And you can see I put some of the numbers there. Throughout the process, we actually had more chem submitted than signatures. So we had a kind of a smaller pool of signatures to work with. And at the end, we had three signature finalists and we had three signature alternates. And of course, we all know by now, we selected three of those signatures for standardization. Um, not worried about chems for this talk, we're just kind of focusing on the signature side of things. So the three signatures we selected, uh, all very good algorithms, crystals, dilithium, and falcon, both based on structured lattices. And then we also had Sphinx Plus based on stateful hash based signatures. So it might seem a little confusing when we selected three signatures, you know, why in the world would NIST want even more signatures? Uh, for standardization, it's good to keep the number of standardized algorithms small for interoperability reasons. Um, and here's kind of the motivation as to why we, why we did this. So during the third round, we had three finalists, three alternates. Uh, one of the alternates, GEMS, was, was broken early on in the third round. And then later on in the third round, the finalist, Rainbow, was broken, um, leaving us just with four signature schemes um, we are considering. We selected Dilithium and Falcon for our finalists, um, and then we had to choose between Picnic and Sphinx Plus. Um, we'd seen early on, you know, having a smaller candidate pool for signatures, uh, looking ahead to the future, we knew that Sphinx Plus, its performance wasn't super great. Um, its security was widely viewed as very conservative, but it was an alternate, and we'd said we were only gonna standardize finalist algorithms. So before the third round ended, we, we communicated this on the PQC forum and asked for feedback, and we said, how would people feel if we, if we selected Sphinx Plus, even though it's an alternate? And then we also, brought up the idea that we may want to consider other signatures in the future, thinking about we want a nice general purpose digital signature that's not a lattice, that would be kind of a, a good complement or, or a good backup. And Sphinx Plus, well, it's not lattice, so that's good for <coughs> diversity of security, but it's not general purpose in that most applications and devices could just easily use it. And so that's what we were thinking about. So but well before the, the third round ended, we asked for feedback, and the feedback we got was that both these ideas seemed reasonable. They, uh, no one was really opposed to either one. Yeah, and so looking at Sphinx Plus, like I've already mentioned, um, based on stateful hash face signatures, uh, there's two charts down at the bottom that you can kind of see. Um, the main thing to notice is where they're very, very tall, that's Sphinx Plus in comparison to Kyber, or not Kyber, Falcon and Dilithium. So the exact numbers don't matter, it's just, yep, it's bigger, it's slower, and so we, we were wanting something better than that. So that's what led us to have the motivation to uh, launch the, what we call the on-ramp, so, um, allowing new submissions into our standardization process. The primary motivation, which we tried to make clear, um, not totally sure everyone still gets it, but is a general purpose digital signature algorithm not based on lattices. That didn't mean we weren't interested in other signature algorithms. We knew that research would have new, new things coming. And there's many applications in particular where short signatures would be especially useful, fast verification. And we kind of had in mind as well that some of the multivariate schemes fit that pretty well. They, they have short signatures, fast verification. So we said, yeah, in particular, there have been a lot of multivariate that have suffered some attacks with the different ideas they tried. There's one type called unbalanced oil and vinegar, which has kind of been around for a while, been a little bit more evaluated. So we said that might be a nice, um, nice one to get a submission for. We knew we'd get some new research, um, which is great. 
On the other hand, for standardization, you only want to standardize algorithms that have been around for a while and had received a lot of cryptanalysis, have, have had time for people to evaluate, to test their performance. So the more mature the scheme, the better. Um, we also said uh, we may need to kind of cut it down to smaller numbers just because we don't want this to be a, a big process. We don't want it to be really long and take too many resources. So if needed, that we could cut down from whatever candidate pool we had to a smaller number at some point, kind of maybe perhaps quicker than needed. And people have sometimes wondered or asked if we're doing the same thing for chems, and we don't have any plans to do that. It's just for digital signatures here. Here's uh, the timeline of the, the process for it. So when we announced our call for, or when we announced the algorithms that we would select, we also simultaneously uh, made this announcement as well that the call for signatures would be, would be coming. Uh, two months later, or no, just one month later, we published the requirements and evaluation criteria so that submitters would know exactly what they needed to do. We had a preliminary deadline where if submitters wanted, they could send in their submission, we would take a look at it, and we could give them some feedback before the final deadline. Um, there was a few that took advantage of that. The final deadline for submission was on June 1st, just uh, five months back or so. And then in July, we posted the algorithms for submission that, that made it. So here's kind of a, just a graphical version of uh, the process. When I look at this, I think, I wonder why we call it the on-ramp. This looks like we're getting off the main track. So it's the on-ramp, or maybe it's the off-ramp. But So we still have round four going on. We'll still have standardization going from that. But this is kind of opening up a, a parallel track for signatures um, that will go on into the future. Some of the numbers here. So we had 17 that, that submitted to us early, and we could give them feedback. By the final deadline, we'd received a total of 50 different submissions. Um, the original call, we received 82 algorithms, 23 of which were signatures. So we had a lot bigger signature pool to, to use this time around. 40 of the 50 submissions met all, all our requirements. Um, we tried to work with submitters, and if they were just missing something, we'd, we'd try and get them to correct it really quick so that we didn't want anyone to miss out for just a, a small reason. But 40 ultimately were accepted into our first round. And we know this takes a lot of work to prepare a submission. Um, there's 262 submitters, so that's an average of you know six and a half people per submission. Some teams have more, some teams have less, but um, yeah, a lot of people working on this, this area. Uh, the record this time around, it looks like there was four submitters who are involved with four submissions. In the original process, there was someone who was on eight submissions, so uh, doing lots of work anyway. There was 45 people we counted that were involved in the original submission and also in this on-ramp submission as well. So I don't know what happened to the 200 and some others. <coughs> Maybe they moved on or are working on other things, but... Just like the first time as well, this was a very international effort. Um, this is the NIST process, and it was emphasized this earlier. These are not US algorithms designed by the United States. These are algorithms designed by teams who come from all over the world. Uh, in particular, there's a lot of European submitters um, who are very, very expert. We had representation from five continents and 28 countries. That's as best as we could count. I, I got those looking at the submission documents and submitters list where they're from, and so I just take it from there um, as best as I can. But it's possible I, I missed a country somewhere. So here are the uh, algorithms, the 40 candidates that were accepted into the process. Uh, we've grouped them according to category here. It's possible somebody could look at this and put an algorithm in a slightly different bucket here. But there was a number of multivariate submissions. Um, of the multivariate, a lot of them were based on UOV, unbalanced oil and vinegar, and then a, a few other ones that were multivariate but not UOV. MPC in the head is kind of this newer research area. Um, five years ago, you know, th this this idea wasn't really being used a lot. Picnic was kind of the the um, 
the seed that germinated and it kind of led into this direction where you're using these uh, techniques. So we had a, a number of MPC in the head. And even though they're MPC in the head, you know, you can break them down because they're based on different security assumptions down at their core. So some are based on multivariate, some are based on codes. Um, and then we had seven lattice based submissions. And even though we weren't, you know, we, we explicitly said we're not looking for lattice based submissions, we still got seven of them. So uh, for a lattice submission, you know, it's got to be pretty good. It's got to improve upon Kyber or Dilithium to be, or not Kyber, Dilithium or Falcon to be interesting to us. But um, so we've got some of them. Code based submissions, a number six. We had four symmetric ones. Uh, just like the first time around, we had one isogeny one. And that isogeny scheme psych, if you recall, it was broken shortly after the announcement. Uh, Ski signs isogeny based, but it's based on kind of a different security assumption, so it's not broken. Um, so it, it's in the process. And then there are some that kind of don't fit into these categories, so they're, they're in the other bucket there. Now the on-ramp's been going uh, July. We posted these up, so it's been going for a few months, and we've already had some attacks or implementation bugs, or teams have already had to kind of adjust their parameters based on some, some things people have noticed. So I think the ones in red that I marked, these are attacks of some sort. Some of them are completely broken. They're scripts that can run in just a you know, very short time and can forge or recover the key. Uh, the ones in green had an implementation bug where they had to, to fix something, but it's not kind of a, a, a break. It's something that was perhaps overlooked when they were creating their submission. And then the, the three in purple, uh, there was some sort of attack or something noticed where they had to rescale their parameters a little bit. They had to adjust since uh, the original submission already. So you can see already there's been a lot of just in the first few months, people are looking heavily at these and looking for how secure are they, what properties do they have that we can potentially exploit, are there any, any, anything in the implementations. Um, we expect evaluation to go on for a while still. Here's a chart that shows the key and signature sizes. Uh, this was put together by Tom Wiggers of PQ Shield. Um, he put up a nice website, and this shows all the signatures, but on, the, on his site you can filter it and sort it down by, you know, if you're wanting to look at multivariate or if you're wanting to look at category one. Um, this is all of them at all security categories. It uh, might be hard to see. The axes are logarithmic, something to keep in mind. Um, so for comparison, you might be able to see there's some purple stars those are the PQC algorithms that were already selected. So the ones, I don't know if there's a pointer there, the ones kind of in the middle, those are Dilithium and Falcon. The purple stars on the left, those represent Sphinx Plus. The blue circles, uh, that one's RSA, and then the other one is EDDSA, so you can see like what elliptic curve sizes are. So you kind of have those as your frames of reference to kind of compare signature sizes and public key sizes. Ideally, things would be towards the bottom left corner. You can see uh, the bottom axis is public key size. So there's a lot that goes off to the right that have really giant public keys. Um, there's some that have really big signature sizes, just a few that are larger than Sphinx Plus. And you can see kind of there's a lot targeting right about that kind of same area that Sphinx Plus is in. This just gives you kind of a, a general idea of sizes of public keys and signatures in general. Um, some of the ones in the bottom left that look really promising, those have been broken, so not as ideal. But uh, I'll talk briefly about just each category, maybe to give a little bit of flavor, not going into real technical detail um, about each one. So multivariate is based on the idea of quadratic equations coming kind of have a system of them with multivariables. It relies on what's called the MQ problem that's been studied for a while. Uh, they typically, their performance profile, they have very large public keys and very, very small signatures. So for some applications, that will work nicely. Other applications, that might not. 
Uh, we had a number of multivariate signatures in the first round, and again, a, a number here in this process. Um, multivariate tends to work better for signatures. There's been some attempts to try and do encryption. It has never really uh, panned out too well. So here's the multivariate signatures, except I noticed these are the UOV ones. Uh, the non-UOV ones, there was three Ys, HPPC, and DME. Um, that I, I somehow left off there. MPC in the head. So again, this is a very kind of interesting newer area. Um, and the idea behind it is you pick a, a security assumption for which you know kind of how to, how to solve, you know the solution to. So maybe you know the solution to the min rank problem for a particular instance. You'll then create a zero knowledge proof around that and use MPC in the head ideas to kind of use Fiat Shamir and turn it into a, an, into a, a signature scheme. <coughs> and so there's that framework works really well and you pick a signature scheme and then, or you pick a security problem and then you kind of play around and see, okay, what's the performance of this gonna be? And if it's too large, you'd ignore it and say, let's try a different problem. And we had a variety submitted. For the most part, their performance looks to be they're kind of comparable to Sphinx Plus. Um, they might beat it in some ways, but kind of that order of magnitude, they're not as fast as the lattices, not as small as the lattices. They're kind of closer in that direction right there. And these are the MPC in the head ones that we have. So there's a variety of them there. Uh, lattices, most people are probably more familiar with them. Um, there's nice talks yesterday in the technical track explaining some of these even more. Uh, they typically have balanced public key and signature sizes, typically pretty efficient. Sometimes you have structure like in dilithium and kyber to get the key sizes down. Interestingly, two of the, the lattice ones submitted to us went with unstructured lattices like Frodo, so they're a lot bigger and slower. Um, and not sure the you know, it's interesting security-wise that they're more conservative, but they're not as performant. So they, they may not be as interesting to us when we're trying to, they need to compete against dilithium and, and falcon. So there are the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different lattice signatures there. Code-based as well. So we've seen uh, code-based for a while. It's been one of the main families studied for PQC. Um, they're typically, like lattices, they have balanced key sizes um, and signature sizes. They're fairly efficient. They're not quite as small as and efficient as lattices, but they're not far behind either. So they make a, a, good, a good place to, to look. Um, again, you can introduce structure to try and get them smaller. There have been a lot of ways where people have tried that, and it's led to unsuccessful attempts or have been broken. So some of these ones that are submitted, they're again using new ideas that we're gonna have to kind of evaluate over time and see if they, they withstand the test of time. So there are our uh, six uh, right there. Symmetric base, kind of like Sphinx Plus, where it's based on hash functions or um, some other symmetric primitives. There are a few different ideas for these. Their performance profile, typically they have small public keys and they have very large signatures. So depending on, again, your application, um, that could be good, could be bad. The analysis is often nice because we have studied symmetric primitives for a while and we can understand their security. So perhaps uh, we have a, a better idea of their security. And we had Aimer, Ask on Sign, that's using ASCON. That was the winner of uh, the lightweight crypto competition that NIST ran, uh, faced. And then Sphinx Alpha is kind of a take on Sphinx Plus where they've modified it in some ways. Uh, there's one isogeny-based algorithm. Um, isogeny is my area of mathematical background, so I could probably bore all your ears off with this. Uh, like Psych, Ski Sign has very small public key size, very small signature size, but performance, it tends to be slower than a lot of the other um, candidates in the process. So uh, we'll see how ski sign does. I didn't make a slide for the other, um, but there's also the, the four that didn't fit in any of those buckets right there. So, 
So how will standardization go for this? Right now we're in the first round. Uh, probably in a few months we'll make a, a cut to a smaller number of algorithms. Um, not sure exactly when that will be. Um, the first round won't last too long. It, I, I doubt it would last more than a year, but we expect there will be multiple rounds, probably three, could be four. You know, we don't know at this point. We'll kind of just go and we'll see how it's going along through the process, but it will take a number of years. A lot of these are newer ideas, and we need to have time for cryptanalysis to make sure we fully understand their security. At the end of this, I would not expect more than two algorithms to be standardized out of this on-ramp process. It could be just one, could even be zero, but I would find it unlikely we'd want to do more than two. Um, we don't want to have too many signature standards. Uh, it, it makes it hard for people that have to maintain all those. Um, sometimes we're asked, uh, or, or people think, since this is a new process, there's new ideas, this will lead to better signatures. It's possible it leads to better signatures. Uh, looking at how we see things, we don't expect any of these to kind of move dilithium out of, out of its spot as the primary algorithm that we expect most people will use for their, for their applications. So these will just be complementing the ones that we have, and uh, that's kind of what we expect. So the on-ramp is just at the very beginning of the process. We've got a long way to go. Um, I'm sure we'll learn new things. There will be new challenges. Each round, algorithms can tweak a little bit, so there will still be room for improvement. We invite everyone, if you haven't already, take a look at the candidates. If you are in a particular field, if you're in lattices or codes or multivariate, you know, take a good look at those. We need everyone to, to evaluate them. Standardization for these will not be for a while. It'll be off in the future. Um, and again, we have all our uh, ways you can communicate and connect with us. We've got our webpage, we've got the PPC forum, um, or you can always just contact us directly. So with that, I'll end there and be happy to answer any questions. Turn this one. No, it's on. Okay, it's on. Awesome. Um, there's already a first question from our online audience. Uh, are you taking the NIST uh, MPC and threshold uh, scheme standardization process into account as well? Because uh, some of the current schemes do not uh, necessarily seem uh, MPC friendly. Yeah, so NIST also has a threshold cryptography project. Um, it's put out a call recently for, um, I won't go into all the details, but there's some intersection there. If it has a property where it could be nicely thresholdizable, yeah, that's of interest, but it's not a requirement or anything like that. Okay, so it's not a hard requirement, but it no. might be a, yep, a nice additional feature. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions in the audience? Yes. Diego. Thank you. I um, asked Bill my question yesterday, and he advised me to address it to you. So. Um, <laughs> A little bit about, about the evaluation uh, in the NIST competition, uh, so how, how it's taking place. Um, to my understanding, it's very difficult to, um, um, to, to implement or even to, uh, to invent algorithms for the quantum computer. And we don't have yet a clue uh, how uh, big uh, the appliance of uh, quantum algorithms shall be. Um, so it might be theoretical, maybe, but um, tomorrow there might be an algorithm found which can break lattice-based uh, uh, security. Mm -hmm. uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on, on the level of assurance we can have um, based on the uh, vetting of the end of the NIST competition? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's a, certainly a valid point <coughs> that any of these PQC algorithms, any of the cryptography we use in general, somebody brilliant could come along tomorrow and discover a new attack. Um, yeah, we don't have a quantum computer to know how fast, how expensive it will be to run. So the best we can do is, is cryptanalysis. Uh, we, we get experts in every field to look at this, to look at the problems, um, particularly in lattices. That's where we selected three of our four algorithms. Um, they've been studied for a, for a long time, received a lot of focus during the process. Uh, we look for existing lines of attack. Do they seem to be continuing? Do they seem to be kind of winding down a little bit? Uh, looking at the security proofs, 
you know, we look at all these things, but at the end, we can't guarantee anything. Yeah, so it, uh, we have a high confidence. We wouldn't have selected them for standardization. Um, you can see the in the US, the National Security Agency also feels confident to protect national security systems with them as well. They have a lot of mathematical expertise. So we can't guarantee anything, but we, we do have confidence or we wouldn't have selected them. Thanks. Uh, okay, all right, so uh, there's another question from our online audience about uh, certification. So uh, FIPS constraints uh, make sure that it might take quite some time uh, to, to uh, um, to arrange the certification following the standardization process. Is this also taken into account in the timelines of the uh, standardization? Yeah, so validation is very, very important. Um, we work with our CMVP and CAVP. Uh, they're a different group inside of NIST that does the validation. They're very clued into this. Their goal is to be ready as soon as the standards are published so that they, they can be validated um, on day one that the standards are there. Now I know there's a backlog and it doesn't always work as, as good as is intended, but that's their goal. Uh, just last week we published, or the CAVP gave us some test vectors that we put online, we announced in the forum, so that if you, if you have implementations of Kyber Dilithium, you can do some um, preliminary checking to see if your implementations are working um, and match those test vectors. But. Yep. Okay, good to hear that uh, certification is already somewhat in scope, I guess. Yep, <laughs> that's the goal. <laughs> yes, there's another question. Aren't you afraid of that the on-ramp process could slower the adoption and transition for the PQC algorithm? Because some in the near future, there could be a better algorithm, so let's wait for this. Yeah, and that's a concern that's been raised, and we understand that. By having kind of different waves of standardization, it, it potentially could slow adoption. People want to wait and see what's the new algorithm or, or so on. It is a valid concern. Um, we feel that we're trying to get the message that Kyber and Dilithium should be your main two algorithms. What we've seen in the on-ramp doesn't look to change that, so we recommend to people start with Kyber and Dilithium um, from there. And the future, yeah, research could change that, but that's how we see it right now. Thank you. Any other questions? Let me quickly check if there's an online question. Okay, then please join me in thanking Dustin again. In today's complex, fast-paced world, you need a partner who can help secure your digital transformation so you can drive your business forward confidently. Someone who can fine-tune and integrate the secure technologies that enable mobile identities, digital payments, and a hybrid workforce. You need a partner who will have your back so you can stay focused on the road ahead and accelerate your organization's growth. Entrust, securing a world in motion.